happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Uncle Chael. I gave you the ghetto happy birthday song that we would get played on the radio in Lafayette, Louisiana. Happy birthday, my friend. And I imagine you're looking for a thank you right now, but I was looking for a cake on the day of my birth, so I guess we both leave with a little bit of discontent. What's happening, guys? I'm Chael, he's Daniel, and you are all very wise for tuning in. We got another great episode of Good Guy, Bad Guy coming at you. Chael, what's up, dog? Hey, that's your new nickname with me. It's just a throwback to the days growing up in Lafayette, Louisiana, where I was pretty cool. So now, as two middle-aged men, 45 years old apiece, I want to call you dog, and it makes me feel good. And I just want to feel good about myself every single day. So, chill. What's up, dog? What's happening? Well, I'm glad you gave me something so unique and creative. That way, a whole bunch of heads don't turn. They'll know you're speaking to me. <laughs> oh, man, chill. Listen, guys, while me and my dog get ready to do this show, we get ready for the fight. It's time to go five rounds with DC and chill right now. Chill. Max Holloway fighting for the BMF title next week. He wants Mark Coleman the original BMF to wrap the belt around his waist. What do you make of that? I think when Max said it, it was likely a gesture to be nice. Mark's been through some really hard things. But the more you stand back and look at it, Daniel, I love it. And I got to tell you this. There's not a lot of times in this sport where we get to be nice. We get to do things with heart. But when you're an old dog and you get recognized by today's current stud, it makes you feel wonderful. And there's not a lot of other things you get in the sport except for remembered. I think it was a very cool move by Max. I love it. The UFC's bringing Mark Coleman and his family to UFC 300. It is a milestone event. And like you said, Chael, nothing's better than being remembered, especially when you're one of the first. Most times, the guys that come first don't get spoken about anymore. Mark Coleman had such an impact that even today, guys know who he is. Guys still respect him. And now they want him to be a part of the show. You and I talk about it constantly. As long as you're a part of the show, it feels really, really nice. Mark Coleman gets to be a part of the biggest show that the UFC has done in a really long time. Hats off to Max Holloway. All right, DC, from an entertainment standpoint, Marab, who is the number one contender at 135, appears to be trolling Sean O'Malley as he brings in somebody to mimic O'Malley. And I don't just mean throw jabs followed by crosses. Take a look at this. Look at Marab. I mean, the guy kind the guy kind of looks like Sean O'Malley. Look, Marab <laughs> Wallace really is a very interesting character. This guy, Marab, is is that Sean O'Malley? Like, who is this? I'm trying to really get what it's is too going good. on here, Chill. I don't know. It's too good. Marab Wallace really rides horses. He does all kind of fun stuff. I got to be honest with you, Joe. He may be the most interesting guy in the UFC right now, and this only furthers to hype the fight. Rowdy Roddy Piper, and I know that I'm name dropping, but one time he gave me advice in the sport, and he just told me, keep doing what you're doing, because the crowd that hates you today, they're going to love you for doing the exact same things. And I only bring that into Marab, because Marab really isn't all of a sudden a showsman. He's been doing things like this all along. It was just rejected, or people didn't understand, or they didn't think that he was good enough. Look, that O'Malley, I actually had to do a double take. I thought it was actually him. The only bad part of the clip is I didn't realize we were doing a spoof. I thought that was O'Malley. I actually thought that was O'Malley. That's bad. Chill, round three. Listen to this one. Listen to this one, Chill. Jack Della Maddalena just revealed that the week before the fight against Gilbert Burns, he had a staph infection, and he did not train the entire week. So now Jack Della Maddalena is telling us he beat Gilbert Burns with a broken arm and staph infection. How impressed are you by this, knowing that now? Or... Is it a little bit like, come on, Jack Della, man? It feels like you're dipping salt in the wounds a little bit. And that's how I feel about it, right? I mean, I know that context is everything. I don't have the context for this. But, Daniel, this is par for the course. This is the new thing that guys are doing in this sport. And we've seen it when guys get beat. We've always seen the excuse train get backed up. We all fully understand it helps to lessen the blow. Then once you get your message out, you go, I'm not trying to make excuses. I was just telling you. You were trying to make an excuse. <laughs> 
But Daniel, it's brand new that the winner is doing this. And that is the part that I kind of look at mm-hmm. as unsportsmanlike. Hey, man, your medical business is your business. I don't know why they're bringing it up. I don't love it. I really don't love it. Look, you won the fight. When you told us that you broke your arm, it just made it more impressive. Now it feels like you're kind of using Gilbert Burns as a prop to prop yourself up when in reality you don't need to. You already won. You beat him. You don't need to say, I'm so good now that I beat this guy with all these things going on. And that's what it feels like to me. I don't like it. I think Jack Della Maddalena needs to just take his victory and kind of go away with it and just get ready for the next one. All right, DC, Dan Ige has offered to fight Volkanovski in Perth. In fact, he even told Volkanovski, if you would like a tune-up fight, I'm here waiting for you. What do you think? Too low. It's too low. There's no way Alexander Volkanovski would do that. It's too low because it's too risky. Look, Dan Ige is a phenomenal fighter. He's a very dangerous fighter, and he's the type of guy that, if you look at the last fight, possesses the type of power that if Alexander Volkanovsky is compromised, he could put him out. It's too dangerous. Volkanovsky is still one fight away from fighting for the belt again, if not for the belt in his next fight. I do not think he should entertain this. I'm not sure that he will, but I did get Ige's point. I mean, Ige's point of if you need one. Oh, and by the way, I know you want to fight in Perth. So we tried to sweeten the pot. I felt as uh, though Ige did a very good job with it. He's got us sitting here talking about it today. And I'm not positive that Volkanovski does walk right into a title shot, Daniel. I'm not saying he doesn't deserve one. I'm not saying the rankings don't support it. I'm not even saying Teporia uh, wouldn't entertain the idea. There's just something about it where I do believe Alex is going to have to do something in between. A lot of people are saying he takes his oars out of the water and just sits for a little bit. I think that's more likely than an immediate title shot. Yeah, absolutely. And chill. Alexander Volkanovsky has earned everything that comes to him going forward. Round five. Brendan Allen takes on Chris Curtis this weekend for the second time. The first time Chris Curtis beat him. But now the shoe's on the other foot. Brendan Allen's riding hot. He has won six fights in a row. What do you see coming out of this fight this weekend in this rematch? I got to tell you, I'm very interested in Curtis. Curtis seems to do all of the things that we generally as fans like. He takes really hard matches, including this one. This one is somewhat short notice in that Allen knew about the fight, but he thought it was going to be against Marvin Vittori. Insert Curtis walking into an atmosphere where he hadn't been successful before. I like that. I get behind that. But I will tell you, Curtis does get a little bit sensitive about things. He has a very hard time blocking things out and focusing on right now. I think he's going to need all of his attention put on Allen. I think that Allen might be the rising star of 2024. Yeah, this is a phenomenal fight between two guys that have been there before. They're much different today opposed to 2021. And it's going to be a great fight, and I cannot wait. But guess what, Chill? If I'm being completely honest, and if it's time to pull the curtain back, I got to tell you, man, I'm going to probably be watching WrestleMania, dog. If I'm being completely honest, I'm strapped to the couch. I'm watching WrestleMania. I requested the weekend off on purpose. I'm watching WrestleMania, Chell. I'm sorry, even though I love Chris Curtis and Brendan Allen. But while I'm res- watching WrestleMania, I call back to last weekend, and then I move forward to next week. So Zach Candido is the coordinating producer, the senior vice. Yeah, he, I got to get his job title right. And they released a promo called Forever Young, Chell. And in that promo, they were able to put people face-to-face that never competed. So let's take a look at some of those matchups. You and I. The first matchup that really stood out to me was Chuck Liddell versus John Jones, right? All these what ifs. What ifs. What if, though, Chill, these errors collided? What would this fight look like? Yeah, isn't that a fun one? I mean, of all of them, when Chuck Liddell was the best in the world, there's very few times where we actually know who the best in the world is, right? We have a ranking system, and then one guy's wearing a belt, but it's always argued about. There was a time, Daniel, when every competitor steps aside and acknowledged Chuck Liddell's greatness. I feel like that same era has arrived for John Jones. That really is the match to make. That was to be a great fight. Like, I got to be honest, man. Like, I popped, and guys, if you don't know what pop means, It's a wrestling term that when somebody hits the curtain, you get excited, you yell and you scream and you act like a teenage girl. I popped when I saw that promo. I thought it was fantastic. And when I saw Chuck and John staring each other down, I thought to myself, that would have been fun. 
Because for a long time, Chill, when Chuck Liddell was riding hot, when he was the man, every time he fought, you wondered, who is Chuck Liddell beating this weekend? That's how dominant he was to a guy like me that was just a wrestler. It was a UFC fight, but it was Chuck Liddell about to beat somebody. Who was it this time? Is it Babalu? Is it Randy? Is it, is it Tito? John Jones started to become that guy, too. That's why he has now gone to heavyweight. He was looking for different challenges. So you take two of the best from their eras, one being one of the greatest of all time, unbelievable. That would be a sick fight. And I'm telling you, man, everybody would be glued to the TV. Okay, Chael, this one is very exciting. Habib Nurmagomedov versus Tony Ferguson. Habib, it was six years ago this week that Tony Ferguson went to Fox to promote the fight between him and Habib. He trips over a wire trail, hurts himself, pulls out of the fight. For the final time, these guys were canceled. This was one that we would have loved to have seen, Chael. Could you imagine now T. Ferguson fighting Habib? Looking back, how could a fight between two guys from the same era never happen when they both fought so well and they were both so dominant? Does it end up in a what-if type of segment? That's crazy. This is for the ultimate arguing points. And for example, you could never make Chuck Liddell versus John Jones. They were different eras. This fight that we're talking about, Khabib and Tony, not only could you make it, they did make it. Bout agreement signed five separate times. Now, please hear me out on this because the fifth and final time they were supposed to fight in New York. That literally moved <laughs> the odds. Just to take you back, that moved the odds on the fight closer to Tony because New York was getting a rap, whether it was accurate or inaccurate, but they were getting a rap for stopping fights earlier than most commissions would due to blood and the fact that Tony was so good with those elbows even from bottom a lot of people thought it was going to give some real opportunity and possibly he would be the one to get over on Khabib you know I remember being at AKA during that time when Habib was on his rise and you could tell right we knew from the moment he walked into the gym jail that he had the potential to be the champion but the whole time all you can really hope for as a fighter is to have someone elevating even with you or someone that starts a little bit ahead of you that you can try to catch up to. Khabib and Tony had that. They were rising at the same time. It was almost a parallel plane that they were running on. And they kept getting into these arguments. And I remember Tony walked up with a baseball. Do you remember him at the press conference holding a baseball? And everybody's wondering, like, what, <laughs> what does the baseball mean? What is he doing with the baseball? He was so odd that he really did become intriguing. And then to me, I'm like, wow, this guy is the most dangerous guy for Habib. Habib, you got to train so hard. You got to do more. You got to do this. You got to do that. Because it felt like Tony Ferguson had the skills to do what most couldn't. But I think what was the most challenging thing in preparation was the unknown. Because he was so odd, Chael, that you did not know what he was going to do in there. Because you can prepare for most. You can get ready for most. But when you got a guy saying he's going to do a low single on you in an octagon, when you're a wrestler of Khabib's caliber, you're like, well, how do we approach this dude? This dude's going to be out here doing crazy stuff. Remember he did that imaginary role to start just about every fight? It was just so odd and different that you didn't know how you prepare, so you had to be a little worried. Unfortunately, that one didn't happen. But I'm telling you, Chael, the entire gym was up at arms because we knew that that would be a tough fight. Now, looking back, Tony Ferguson, as he went on, I don't know if that was the case. But in that moment, it felt like it was. And not to mention the selling of confidence by Tony. Everybody that was getting ready to fight Khabib said all of the right stuff. They went to the press conference and they're going to be the guy and they can do things that other people can't. I believe that Tony truly believed it. And, and the greatest fights that you have are when two guys walk out there and they both are fully confident that they are going to win. That doesn't happen as many times as it gets presented that way. But Tony Ferg did believe that he could deal with Khabib and that in and of itself was enough to make me want to see that fight. If anybody was around Tony Ferguson or around Habib, he would have told him, Chase Saldate, one of my senior wrestlers at the time, would wrestle Khabib, and Tony accused me of American child abuse because I let the Dagestanis beat, Chael, beat 
Chase in wrestling when in reality was preparing Chase to win the state championship. Dude, it was just a wild time when you were preparing for Tony Ferguson. Before I get to Rumble Johnson and Lex Predator, I want to ask you, though, Chill, Jones, Chuck Liddell, who wins? Jones would have beaten him. It just would have been a very different fight. The one thing that most people do, you can only close your eyes and imagine what you've seen before. And it looked like Chuck, uh, being a wrestler, could stop the takedown. And then he was so dominant on his feet. What people don't realize about Jones, Jones only shows what he has to. Jones was just as good at ground and pound as he was at hurting people on his feet. And I just think overall, with the youth, with the reach, I'm a favorite John Jones. Okay, Habib versus Ferguson. Who won? Oh, uh, Habib would have beat him, but Tony would have helped him. One thing that Tony uh, never did a great job of was understanding if I don't finish the guy on the bottom, the judges aren't going to give me the round. Tony was so stubborn on that, and he respected, loved his jujitsu so much, he just never quite understood a 10-9 must system. But it would have been a long and grueling <laughs> fight, and Tony could have made Habib work. I think that he would have at a minimum, and I'm talking about Tony here, he would have at minimum gone the distance with him. That would have been a great fight. Okay, Chael, now another one. Two of the biggest power punchers in MMA history. Anthony Rumble Johnson, you know, God rest his soul, and Alex Pareda. What would you make? Could you imagine the arena when this happened? I remember sitting in the arena when Anthony Johnson fought Glover Teixeira. It ended up being a 15-second knockout by Rumble. But I remember the expectation of what the fight was going to be because they were both so good and so powerful. You remember, Chael, was when Glover was like the Mike Tyson of MMA, where Mike would go watch him fight, and Glover was always bobbing his head as he entered. It was just this expectation of just a great fight. But this Predator, he could match Rumble's power. How excited would that one have been? That would have been a ton of fun, and you know what? It's almost a hedge by me, almost a cowardly answer, because in five-round contest, I would favor Piera, but in a three-round contest, I would favor Rumble. Look, I don't think that people fully understood what Rumble can do with ground and pound, with what he can do with control, what his uh, collegiate uh, athletic wrestling career was like, because he came, came so good with those hands, right? He fell in love with some of that power. Boom, ask Gustafson, ask Glover to share. It's just one of those spots where if it was early in Piera's career, before everybody knew who great he was, and Rumble didn't have that sense of danger, and he went in and just fought him, Rumble Johnson would have caught him and put him down is my prediction you know that's one of the things and that was one of the the, the things that i did to anthony chill and you know uh being a, a wrestler uh, uh, it's a lot of it we call it big brothering right where you take a guy that you know has looked up to you and you make sure he always is reminded that at some point he looked up to you and that's what i always did to anthony and anthony uh at times would fall victim to that and like you said, if he didn't know who Alex was, he would have burned right through him. But if, uh, if he kind of started to understand this guy was great, he would go try to put it on you. He wasn't going to give it to you. But, he, you know, he'd be like, ah, oh, this is a little harder than I expect. And that's what um, I always tried to use to my advantage. And I love Rumble. I'm trying to be very careful with my words because he's, he's gone today. But I, I know that that is what I use. Chell, real quick before we move on, Anthony Johnson, such a sweetheart. Bro, when he passed, right, him and I, we still had a relationship past fighting. Chell, when he passed, the, the, the gal that he was seeing reached out to me. Anthony left me a watch. Left me a watch because I was a person that made an impact on his life from when he was in junior college wrestling and through our competitions in the UFC. Just an absolute sweetheart of a man but he was a killer inside the octagon chill. Yeah, he sure was. He was fun. There was even a fight, Rumble uh, versus John Jones. I just remember The Rock weighing in on it. And The Rock said, I love John Jones, but Rumble is going to be the next champion. I only offer you that story to speak to. At, at Rumble's height, it was something special. Daniel, that's a beautiful story about the watch, by the way. I appreciate that you told that to me. But I do want to uh, remind you of this. When he retired, that came from out of nowhere. And there was all sorts of speculation, yeah. including that Rumble was going to go on to be the strength and conditioning uh, coach for the Rams, the football team. I happen to believe some of those things. I knew it must be something special and great to step down from that high spot that he had, one of the top five draws in our sport at the time. Daniel, I never did find out. Why did he retire? What was the opportunity that Rumble was moving over to? 
I, I, I still don't know. It just never really came to fruit. It just never, I don't know. I really, I honestly don't know uh, what he walked away uh, to do. But I do know that he was happy until he got sick. Chill. Matt Hughes versus Kamaru Usman. Who gets the job done there? All right, now this is somebody just being nice because th this is not a competitive fight, right? I mean, these were just uh, different eras. Kamar Usman is the only person that you can argue is in front of George St. Pierre for welterweight goat and not lose credibility and be laughed out of the room. You're not going to win that argument. George is still the great, but I'm sharing. I mean, come on, Kamar beat them all. And it was a much harder generation then. Then he lapped it. He was getting ready to do it a third time. It's to the point that he's even walked away from the division. Some people say he's coming back. I don't know about that. But come on, this is somebody trying to be nice. The era that Kamara lived through versus Versus the one that Hughes competed in were not remotely the same. Well, you look at the nine title defenses by Matt Hughes, and when you defend the belt that many times, you're obviously in the conversation as one of the greatest of all time. But what Kamaru Usman did in this time, Chael, six title defenses in today's mixed martial arts is really unheard of. It's not going to happen many more times as we go forward. We have dominant champions that we don't believe will defend the... Alexander Volkanovsky, for as good as he was, might have defended that belt five times. That is crazy to think that you can defend the belt more than six times in the world of MMA today. You're not fighting specialists very often. You're fighting well-rounded mixed martial artists that are just good at everything they do. But yes, I would have loved to have seen the kid from Northern Illinois fight against Kamaru Usman because that kid from Northern Illinois was a real hard-nosed wrestler, a tough guy, a truck and he would fight you hard. And he reminded me of Lee Fullhard. Nobody will know who Lee Fullhard is. But Lee Fullhard was a wrestler that didn't have the most skill. But his ability to push and work put him to two out of three against Kale Sanderson, who eventually went on to become the Olympic champion. But because Lee was so tough, he didn't seem like he belonged there with you. He was good enough to really push you. And I think that is what Matt Hughes would do with a Kamaru Usman. Well, that's a beautiful compliment to Lee, by the way. I hope that Full Heart is watching this. He's on Border Patrol now, uh, fighting on behalf of the federal government. Just for a quick uh, update so that you know where those guys are. I will tell you, the idea of testing a real great from one era and putting him with another era was actually done. It was done in Los Angeles. It was my second fight ever in the UFC, so I happened to be on that card. And it was Matt Hughes himself taking on Hoist Gracie. And we just kind of got a reminder that it's... Different eras, right? You're, you're not being a jerk if you say that, that Jordan uh, and Colby, uh, if you start arguing about who was better there, it's, it's a different time. And, and before you think that you're awarding Jordan, you're really insulting basketball if you do that because you, you're essentially saying that his best years are behind them or that as a sport, it hasn't grown over time. So there's not an insult in taking someone from a different era, but making believe that anybody from that time could go with Kamar Usman, I think is a massive stretch. You're right. And, and Kamar Usman really is the only person you could speak about in welterweight that you could talk about on the same line as George St. Pierre because George St. Pierre was so special. All right, Chael. All Hawaii, Max Holloway versus BJ Penn. Now, look, this one might be a little more interesting because while the eras are different, BJ seemed to be ahead of his time. So if BJ was ahead of his time when he was riding hot, that would have pushed him into that era that Max Holloway started in. BJ not only could have gone with him, BJ would have beat him because of something that you brought up earlier, which is called Big Brother Syndrome. Um, there is no chance that Max Holloway did not have a picture of BJ Penn on uh, the wall of his bedroom. There's no chance that Max at some point in time did not wait in line to have a book or a photo or a t-shirt signed by BJ Penn. I'll tell you this from personal experience. There was a time when BJ Penn was ranked number one in the world, pound for pound. He came out to Team Quest. I personally got my hands on him, but I also watched him go with Randy Couture, who at that time was the sitting world champion, Matt Lindland, who at that time was ranked uh, number one in the world, Dan Henderson, who at that time was the pride champion, Evan Tanner, who was the up-and-comer that was only about a year away from having the belt himself. I can tell you firsthand, there was a time 
When BJ Penn truly was the best, he was the best pound for pound. He was too slippery. You couldn't hold him down. He had flexibility. He would go for techniques that nobody had seen before. He could slow a match down so the conditioning did not become part of it. If you put BJ at his best against Max, BJ could have beat him. Do you remember BJ Penn fought at heavyweight? Do you remember BJ Penn was the first American to win like a jiu-jitsu world championship? BJ Penn really was everything. And he would come out to that slow Hawaiian music. His family was there. It just was a whole thing to be involved with BJ Penn. But Max Holloway was, again, Jill, furthering what the pass was. He was the Hawaiian guy that came after the guy, and he actually he surpassed it. He became bigger than what BJ Penn was. When you're on that island, now they speak of Max Holloway as they speak of BJ Penn when a few years ago, you would never have thought that that was even possible. That is how special Max Holloway is. They are phenomenal fighters, both of them well-respected, both of them legends. And Chael, that would have been a great fight. You brought up my boy Matt Lindland. I got to tell you, man, one time I was in the locker room with Matt Lindland, and that dude told me that before fights he would never shower. It was one of the worst smells I've ever experienced in my entire life. I even asked Matt, I go, you get in the bed with your wife like that, son? He was like, if it's fight week, then she has got to deal with the jail. I have to say it. You know it as a former trading partner of our guy, Matt Lillard. Chael, who wins the BJ Penn fight? Even though I know you're going to say something about my man, Matt. <laughs> I was in that locker room, Daniel. You were out there supporting King Mo. I was in Matt's corner. He was taken on Jacare. You and I knew each other, but we never really visited. And you pulled me aside. And you said, hey, man, is everything okay? Can you smell that? As though I couldn't smell. Rampage Jackson fought him one time and said he smelled like two weeks. And a lot of people didn't know what that was referencing. I don't even know if that's an expression. He smelled like two weeks. I was dying laughing. I mean, that was a great line by Rampage. I know exactly what you mean. To the point that I've almost lost my train of thought here but i'll tell you bj penn he really was something special he represented something listen i don't know that we've had anybody debut debut their mixed martial arts debut in the modern era i'm not going back to, to seg more entertainment in 1993 in the modern area but bj penn did his first ever mma fight was in the ufc i believe it was even against dean thomas and he won it by finish and he got that opportunity because nobody wanted to fight him and he was the first american ever to win the world jiu-jitsu uh championship Championship. The only person I could compare that to would be Kane Velasquez. Now, Kane did have fights outside the UFC, but Javier had to go to Dane and say, look, I can't get him any fights. The word's out. Nobody will compete with this guy. You either got to do me a favor and sign him, or I got to retire him because he can't get matches. That's as close as I can get, but BJ's actual debut was in the octagon. That's pretty special. Yeah, very, very special. All right, Chael, last one. Two good-looking guys in this one. Look at this. Look at these two studs in the middle of the octagon. This is wrestling. This is the Ohio State University versus the Oklahoma State University as they pitted me versus the hammer, Mark Coleman. Oh, my goodness. That would have really been something special. Here's the problem that the hammer would have had. The hammer is as good as anybody for the first few minutes. The problem he's going to have with Daniel Cormier is Daniel Cormier fights all 15 minutes. Eventually, Daniel would have worn him down. But Mark Coleman would have been a threat. Daniel would have had to push him into the fence. He'd have to keep him there. He'd have to also watch those knees. But in the end, the big guy with the belt would have still had it. <laughs> Chael, I got to be honest with you. You know, me and Coley, Coley was, like, insanely strong when I was still competing and he was older and I would grab him. But long as there were no headbutts, there were no soccer kicks, I'd be fine. But I tell you one thing, man. Any of those guys that fought in pride and that fought in headbutting and, and soccer kicks, those guys are from a different mindset. They compete at a different level. And I would worry about fighting them. But yes, I love that I was involved in that promo because I immediately went to the internet channel and I said, wow, that was sick. That was great to see all these legendary fighters in the octagon together. They had Conor McGregor yelling at, at, a, at someone from a press conference. They had Dominic Cruz going back and forth with Sean O'Malley. It was just a great promo and it felt like the UFC, once again, is elevating. Because even in those little things, it can be better. 
And it just shows me that the UFC never settles. And this promo did that for me. Really made me look forward to UFC 300. And I was already as excited as I've been for a fight card in a real long time. Yeah, those are my memories, DC. I mean, that, that was my childhood growing up. I remember my junior in high school, first time that I ever saw UFC, going home that night and telling my father, I found out what I want to do with my time, what I want to do with my life, what my new pursuit is going to be. Really something special the way they encapsulated that. I know you give a shout out to Zach Candido, but it is very important that Dana White within his team has fans, that he has fans that turned into professionals because a lot of people would not have thought to go back as far as Candido did, but I know those are his memories too all right guys so last week i told you guys that if you put questions in the comments chill and i would answer it so guess what the god mike is back and this time we're joined by corporate air corporate air what do we have from the fans this week all right this question is from ricky jasso 197 if you could for one night change your height and weight to fight in another weight class which would it be, and who would be your dream fight for that weight? Chill. All right, Ricky, I appreciate the question. And you know what? I would have stayed in the same weight class. My ultimate nemesis was Anderson Silva. That guy used to keep me up at night. I had a true grudge. I had a true chip on my shoulder, and I got to do it. So I couldn't change the weight class. But one thing I would have done, Ricky, I would have changed eras. I really admire the guys like Hoist Gracie, who got up and had to walk out there three times in one evening. If you win or lose, but you get up and you walk outside three times in a night, you have my respect forever. Chill, you know what I'm doing, Chill? I'm staying, actually, you know what? I might, no, no, I'm staying the same height, but I'm going to 145, chill. I'm going to 145 because I'm going to fight Max Holloway. For a long time, Max and I have tried to decide who is the daddest man on the planet. Max Holloway and I have wanted to fight each other for a really long time. Unfortunately, we have not been able to come to terms because of the weight, right? He wants me to go to 145. I can't make the weight, Chill. I, I haven't made that weight since I was 13 years old. And if not for anything else, Chill, I would go to 145 at my height because, by God, I would look good in the suit that I wore at the press conference. Could you imagine throwing on a suit at 150 pounds? You would look like a model. So, yes, I'm going to 145, first off, to beat Max Holloway, but second, to wear a beautiful custom-fitted suit. Because if I look good today, imagine me at 145. Hey, I think that's amazing. And I'm sure that Max would see you and he'd like to be even bigger and closer to heavyweight. The littler or smaller guys that really got some run in my lifetime that inspired me, but it was the true four horsemen. And I'm talking about Hearns, Leonard, Hagler, Duran. I like the focus on those weight classes. It then went away. Everything went back to the big guys. The heavyweights ruled the world, the Mike Tyson era and whatnot. But then De La Hoya, Mayweather, McGregor gets added to that list. Started to bring some shine and spotlight back. Remind us that there are more weight classes than just the big boys. Good memories there, DC. All right, DC, I would love a reaction from you. But first, listen to this. The UFC organization was notified tonight that the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency has informed John Jones of a potential anti-doping policy violation, and therefore, the fight has been removed from the fight card. I really don't know exactly how to explain how I'm feeling right now. More than, more than anything, just really disappointed. I'm just here to fight. And a fight he will get. Anderson Silva answers the bell. Daniel Cormier happy to sign on the dotted line. We've got a fight. All right, DC, we are on the road no to 300, and that's the reason I tossed back here to 200. It wasn't to bring back bad memories, but what do you make of that? Yeah, man, it, I remember that that week just feeling massive because do you remember at UFC 200, they had fights every night. They had fights on Thursday night. They had fights on Friday night. They had fights on Saturday night. And I remember going through that whole deal with Jones and then the relief of Anderson Silva being the guy that stepped up. So losing a big fight but getting a big fight in return was massive for me. I remember the environment. I remember it being the first fight ever in the T-Mobile arena. I remember being in the locker room with Brock Lesnar. I just remember it being 
one of the greatest nights of my entire career and watching the excitement and knowing that the UFC was getting bigger in that in 2016, Chael, you got to remember, there was a lot of uncertainty. The UFC was selling to Endeavor. You didn't know what the future looked like. But on that night, you were assured that it was in good hands and it was only getting better. And now we're already at UFC 300 and it feels like it's grown 10 times over. So it continues to get bigger and better every time. Dana, what was that like for you, though? I've actually never asked you about this. When you find out that Jones is out, okay, great, let's set that aside. you got to focus on the task at hand, and one of the greats, Anderson Silva, is getting on a jumbo jet. He is leaving Sao Paulo. He is coming to Las Vegas, and he's coming after you. I mean, what did you think of that? Did you think, oh, I got him at a good time. I don't need to worry about him. He's a smaller guy. It's a non-title fight. Or did you realize, I got a problem, and he's flying my way right now? It was hard. It was hard to really flip the switch right away because – when you are so hard on your diet, nutrition, for the biggest fight of your life, one that I had been waiting for for a really long time, I had to shift the mindset. And once I was able to shift, I mean, that was a lot of tears and crying, didn't want to train, didn't want to do anything. But once he took that fight, because, Chell, you got to remember, on the day that he got pulled, I had to go that night and maintain a workout and train without knowing that Anderson was going to step up. So it was a lot of, like, uh, self-motivation and self-talk to get myself to continue to do what I needed to do in order to prepare. But it was fun. It was exciting once I knew who I was fighting. And uh, I really did kind of pull from uh, your fights. I was like, I've got to take this man down because he's only less, he's 200 pounds, right? Chael was able to take him down and control him. I will be much heavier than him. I need to take him down and control him because it's much too risky to fight him on the feet. Daniel, I know exactly what you mean, that pit in your stomach, that feeling you have where you got to get up and go to practice when everything that you were planning and practicing for is now gone. Hey, partner, I had the same feeling in reverse. I was on the John Jones side of it. I'm getting ready to go into practice. Clayton and Bamba are in my garage at my house when I get a call from the Nevada State Athletic Commission that I have been popped and the news is coming out tomorrow. So I go into the garage, wrapping my hands to do a workout for a fight that I know is about to get scrapped because you're boy was breaking the rules yet again I mean I've got to tell you it's a really hard thing to do it's a hard thing to keep that face on it's a hard thing to drive it's hard to jump rope for a fight that isn't going to happen and you know it I mean I'm just sharing with you I can recreate that feeling I can only imagine how difficult that was for you well you're just hopeful you're just hopeful that it works out but Chael on your end it wasn't working out my brother I'm sorry I'm not trying to twist the knife but you know at least I had hope that it would possibly happen. <laughs> you were breaking the rules, my friend. It wasn't happening. You were being hopeful. Chill. Now, hopeful is the thing that we all have. We are all hopeful for something. What I am hoping for is a great WrestleMania. It's been a fantastic WrestleMania season to this point, Chill. It's been awesome to watch the, the them build, to watch The Rock back and Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins. WrestleMania 40 is this weekend from Philadelphia, so it got me thinking, who do you think were the five most entertaining wrestlers of all time? We like lists, Chill. It's like one of the things I love to do. I love lists. Oh, actually, you know what, Chill? You don't get a list. You get to react to my list because I'm the wrestling aficionado here at Good Guy, Bad Guy. I have the list. You don't get a list, so let me start and you get to break down what I believe is the greatest list in all of wrestling history. So at number five, I got a bit of a tie. I got Rey Mysterio, and I got Shawn Michaels. Let me tell you why I got Rey Mysterio and Shawn Michaels. Because when Rey Mysterio was in WCW, and they had the Cruiserweight division, you had never seen people do what Rey Mysterio was doing inside the ring. And then Shawn Michaels is one of the greatest performers of all time. So that is my number five. I got a bit of a tie, chill. It's hard at times to get just five when you're talking about these types of guys. At number four, chill, I got a bit of a tie. I got the Macho Man Randy Savage, and I've got Ric Flair because the Macho Man is my favorite wrestler of all time. And boy, anytime your boy Flair was on TV, you were entertained. And while you might have hated the Horseman, you loved watching the Horseman, and mainly it was because of the Nature Boy. At number three, Chael. Come on, guys, run that. I got 
The Undertaker. Because when that bell would hit, boom, boom, and Paul Bearer and The Undertaker would walk out with the urn, you were locked in. You were entertained. You could not take your eyes off of this guy. This guy went from being a redheaded guy in WCW that could not win. He was a jobber, is what we call him in the business, to being one of the greatest wrestlers of all time in the WWE. He got with a promoter that knew how to use him, and we got The Undertaker. At number two, it's time to acknowledge. Oh, no. Number two is The Rock. I think The Rock was my second best. The Rock dude changed everything. He kind of made wrestling cool. He was funny. He was charismatic. And he took all of that and moved into Hollywood where the train did not stop. He continued to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And during his time at the top, The Rock was the absolute best. At number one, though, chill. Acknowledge your tribal chief, Roman Reigns. That is the most entertaining wrestler of all time. The tribal chief, Joe Anuai, Roman Reigns, the champion that have held the belt for over 1,200 days, stepped into the ring on Sunday, stepped onto the ring on Saturday. The WWE has done good business for a really long time, Chael, but they've never done business like they are doing right now with Roman Reigns as the head of the table. The tribal chief, acknowledge. Hey, you put your one up like that, Chael? You acknowledge your tribal chief. Roman Reigns as the most entertaining wrestler of all time. Joe, what do you make of that list? Tell me, please. Objection, Your Honor. Not only do I dispute the list, I don't even think that you're showing a sincerity in it. I don't know if WrestleMania is coming up and you're hoping to get a little advancement of tickets. I mean, if we should let the crowd know, in 2014, I saw you in the nosebleeds. The only person with a worse seat than me was you and Candido. I was embarrassed where I was sitting. I turn and look, and you and Zach are about three rows back, and you tell me that you got spotted some tickets. I want to say it's by Seth Rollins. Jack Swagger was my hookup. I drove all the way there to sit by you in those nosebleeds. Please. Now, I want to go with number five. I mean, let me just start at number five. First off, this is your list, DC. This wasn't done in front of me or the world. You did this in private. So if you needed to put two guys, why didn't you just make it a top six list? And I, I, I want to say this. You got a list where you're not including the Ultimate Warrior? I don't believe you. I don't believe no, as a wrestling no, fan that no. you ever had a hyper anticipation bigger than when Warrior with a belt on one shoulder was taken on Hogan with a belt on the other shoulder. And speaking of Hogan, numbers don't lie. There is no chance that you believe that the Hulkster, and he might not have known the difference between a wrist lock and a wrist watch, but boy, he knew how to bring people to his feet. Right hand and a leg drop. Come on, a body slam here and there, and he made as much money as he did. He's got to be on there. And never mind that you said the macho man of Miss Elizabeth. I'll concede to that. I used to have a poster of him in my room. You put the rock out there as a great entertainer. Chris Jericho said that the rock could read you a Chinese menu and make it entertaining. I believe that he's right, but you don't put Stone Cold Steve Austin on that list. You oh, don't put the greatest character in wrestling, which is Vincent K. McMahon. The greatest heel in wrestling is either Vince McMahon or Ted DiBiase. Remember when Ted DiBiase would pay little kids and then kick the ball and not give them their money? Or, or he'd go to yes, a, a clinic yes. and there'd be a bunch of sick people waiting there, but he needed a Band-Aid, so he would pay someone at the door to cut him in front of the line. That was one of the great characters of all time. Hulk Hogan loves to throw Andre the Giant in there. He doesn't belong. I like big guys, Big John Studd, King Kong Bundy, uh, come to mind. But as far as the great workers go, I mean, come on. DC, what about Mr. McMahon? Hey, listen, I forgot about Mr. McMahon. I forgot about Stone Cold. Hogan doesn't belong. He wasn't good enough. He did. I, I'm a bit of a mark, so he didn't entertain me enough with his work, right? He wasn't good enough. But now you have to acknowledge your tribal chief. Guys, it's Thursday. It's Thursday. We're done with good guy, bad guy for the week. So nobody else gets a chance. Chill, get your one up. Acknowledge your tribal chief right now, Chill Sonnen, as he goes into the ring this weekend to defend his belt on Sunday and fight the tag team match on Saturday. WrestleMania is this weekend, but Chael and I are back next week, Monday and Thursday, for new episodes of Good Guy, Bad Guy, wherever you get your podcast. Find us on YouTube, ESPN Plus, and ESPN 2 at 9 Eastern.